This video goes with section 13 of Hansen and Quinn's Greek, an intensive course, and it covers an overview of the noun and case system. You can find this section in Hansen and Quinn on pages 17 to 21. So we're going to talk about nouns, which is a part of speech. English has it as well as Greek. And a lot of this video is going to talk about the way English works as you learn how Greek nouns work. First of all, Greek nouns have three characteristics, each of them. One of them is gender. Greek has three genders, three grammatical genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Now in English, we have some words like man and woman that are gendered. That is to say that we think of them as particularly masculine or particularly feminine. But most nouns, most person, places, or things in English are neuter, what we would think of as it's, like a table we don't think of as um, feminine or masculine. But in Greek, every noun is either masculine or feminine and neuter. And it doesn't matter if that's something that in real life we consider male or female. So for instance, logos means word and it's grammatically masculine. Techne means skill or art and it's grammatically feminine. And ergon means work or deed and it's grammatically neuter. When you learn these words, you'll also learn that even the form of the that goes with each of these words changes according to gender. So it will be holagos, the word, heitechne, the skill, and ta ergon, the deed. Greek nouns all also have number. Greek has three numbers. Singular, when you're talking about one of a thing. Dual, when you're talking about two of a thing or pair of things, and plural when you're talking about more than one or more than two things. Dual is fairly rare in Greek, and so Hansen and Quinn doesn't teach it in the main body of the text, although you can find the dual uh, paradigms in the appendix of Hansen and Quinn. So English also has singular and plural. English nouns also have number, so we can have a table, or we can have tables. So the same words I showed you with their gender, logos, tacne, and ergon, those are all singular, but I can also make them plural, logoi, tacnai, and erga. And just as in English, it's the end of the word, table versus tables, that tells me that it's singular or plural. In Greek, we're also going to look at the end of the word to decide if a word is singular or plural. So, logos versus logoi, tekne versus teknai, ergon versus erga. In that way, English nouns and Greek nouns have a lot in common. Now, all Greek nouns also have something called case. These are the five cases that you will learn in Greek, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. And what these five categories do is tell you what a noun is doing in the sentence, what role it has to play in the sentence. Now, English mostly doesn't have case, but it does show up in a few places. For instance, the pronoun, the masculine pronoun, he, his and him, he is actually what English calls the subject case or the nominative case. You only use it for the subjects of sentences. His indicates possession, and him you use as the direct object or object of preposition. And it's the same with who, whose, and whom. Again, there, English has a little bit of case left in it. You only use who when it's the subject of a verb, whose to indicate possession, and whom to be the object of something. But otherwise, English mostly doesn't use case. Greek nouns, however, also change their endings, like those pronouns, to tell you what it's doing in a sentence. 
So let's look at this a little bit more and about how things work in a sentence. So we're going to start talking about the case system. Here's an English sentence. The girl gives the boy a rose. And what we have there is a pretty simple sentence, but here's what's going on in it. The girl is the subject. The girl is the word, is the noun doing the verb. The verb is gives, and we're going to talk lots more about verbs in unit two, but right now we're focused on nouns. So the girl is the subject, the grammatical subject of that verb, and it's doing the verb. And she is giving. What she is giving is the direct object. The verb leads directly to that object, the rose, and so that is the direct object. But indirectly, the boy gets some of the action. He's the indirect object. And another way to say this in English is the girl gives a rose to the boy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But here is the grammatical structure, the jargon that goes with this little sentence. The girl is the subject, the boy is the indirect object, and the rose is the direct object. We can change those words around and have exactly the same words but in different positions in the sentence. And now in English that means the boy is the subject, the girl is the indirect object, and the rose stays the same because it's in the same part of the sentence. So the boy gives the girl a rose, same words, different order, but it means something completely dif different. This time it's the boy who's doing the giving and the girl who gets the rose as the indirect object. This keeps going. We can move other words around and if we put the rose in the first position, it doesn't make as much sense, but the rose gives the girl a boy means the rose is doing the giving, the rose gets to give the boy as the direct object, and the girl gets the boy. So this would be funny in English because although all those words by themselves make sense, in that order they're a little ridiculous because they don't reflect something that could usually happen in the real world. By the same token, when we use one of those pronouns that has some case in the wrong place in a sentence to do the wrong thing in a sentence, we also get something that's a little bit funny. Him gives the girl a rose. We know that in standard English, in the way that we've learned to speak standard English, him doesn't belong as the subject, but here it is sitting in the subject order, that is, English likes to have its subject at the very beginning as the first thing. And so him there doesn't make a lot of sense. We know what it means, but it sounds a little bit funny because what we expect there is the word, the pronoun in the nominative, in the subject case, he. He gives the girl a rose would make sense, would sound the way we expect English to sound. And that's a little bit what goes on in Greek. So let me give you the same sentence again. The girl gives the boy a rose. And now let me put that sentence into Greek. And I don't expect you to know any of these words yet. He parthenos didosi to koro to rodon. He parthenos didosi to koro to rodon. And what I did was I put the words that correspond to the English right underneath the words in English. So, he parthenos is the girl, didosi is gives, tokoro is the boy, and torodon is a rose. But if I switch the order the way I did um, in English above, and I put the word for boy at the beginning, and the word for girl where the word for boy was, what I get is Tokoro didosi he parthenos torodon. So same words switched around. But here, what I have is actually the same sentence. It still means the girl gives the boy a rose because he parthenos is in the nominative case and tokoro is in the dative case. And that means he parthenos has to be the subject no matter where it is in word order. And tokoro has to be the indirect object, no matter where it is in word order. So let me explain some of that a little bit more. 
here we have the same sentence, the girl gives the boy a rose. And both of the sentences in Greek down there say the same thing, the girl gives the boy a rose. And I know that, again, because of case. So here are the five cases that you're going to learn for Greek. And the nominative case is always the case of the subject. Hey, Parthenos is the subject in the first position there in the first Greek one. But even though it's moved to a different part of the sentence in the second Greek sentence, it still is nominative, so it's still the subject. And the reason I know that is because of the endings. Parthenos, Parthenos, they're both nominative endings. I'm going to look to the end of the word to see what case it is. The same thing happens with the direct object. These are all in the accusative case and it is by the ending that I see that. So even if I had moved Torodon to someplace different, it would still be accusative and it would still mean that the rose has to be the direct object. It's the same with the indirect object. You need the dative case for that and tokoro is in the dative case and it's still in the dative case in both of those Greek sentences so it's the indirect object no matter where it appears in the word order. And again I look to that ending to tell me that it's dative. So let me tell you a little bit more about the different cases. Some of this will sink in now and a lot of it will sink in later and you just need to start getting used to the idea that it's the case that tells you what a noun is doing in the sentence, not where in the word order the noun is. It's the ending and the case that tells you what it's doing. So first we have nominative. And nominative is the subject of the sentence or something that agrees with the subject of the sentence in the predicate. So if you say something is something else, what it is will also be in the nominative. So a predicate that equals the subject is also going to be in the nominative case. So I am a teacher. The teacher would agree with I, which would both be nominative. Or if I wanted to say um, you are studious, you would be nominative because it's the subject of the verb are, but studious would also be nominative because it tells you what that subject is. It's an equal sign sort of thing. So that's nominative. Genitive does more than one thing. It does a lot of the things that we use of for in English. So it allows a noun to limit another. Very often that's possession. And we'll have many examples of this, but for instance, the book of my sister or my sister's book, it tells you that that book belongs to my sister. Another thing that genitive does is the general idea of separation or motion away from something. So you, we will learn many uses of the genitive that share in that meaning. When we get to the dative case, we also have several things that it can do. Often, it's things that we do in English with the prepositions to or for. The dative will indicate someone or something that's interested in or affected by whatever's going on in the sentence. And this is actually where indirect object comes from. If you give a rose to someone, they are particularly interested in or affected by the action in that sentence. Again, we'll learn many specifics that go with that meaning of the dative. We will also use dative to indicate instrumentality, what you use, what instrument, um, by means of what you get something done. And dative will also show us um, where something is happening in time or space. It'll indicate a particular spot, not movement, but a particular spot in time or space. And then we get the accusative, which is most of the time doing the direct object will learn other specific uses for the accusative and it often indicates motion towards. And our last case is the vocative, which is what you use when you want to call someone's name or address something directly. So usually that's when you're calling out somebody's name. Um, hey Sophocles, do this for me. Um, and Sophocles would be in the vocative case. But I suppose that there will be times when you will, oh, I don't know, uh, address 
mm, the road that you are are traveling on or something in some sort of dramatic way where you need to talk directly to something that doesn't have a name and we'll still talk about the vocative. Students of Latin will notice that there is no ablative case in Greek and most of the things you may have learned to use the ablative for in Latin will be taken care of by the genitive or the dative case. The genitive, the dative, and the accusative can all be objects of prepositions too. And when you start to learn prepositions in Greek, you will always learn what case they go with. So each preposition has particular cases that they prefer. And sometimes you'll see that that matches up nicely with the ideas of separation or motion towards that are, are inherent in the cases themselves. So again, I don't expect all of this to sink in now. But these are the general categories of the case system that you'll be using. And how will you know what case a noun it is in so you know how to use it in the sentence? It will be the spelling of the end of a noun that tells you its case. So you will look at the end of a noun. You will see what ending it has. You will know the patterns of endings that I'll tell you about in a second. And you'll decide which of your list of uses of that case makes sense in the context of the particular sentence. Sounds overwhelming at the moment, but we'll learn them bit by bit and you'll see how easy it is, how much sense it makes sense in context as we start to learn Greek vocabulary and sentence structure. So let's look at this a little bit more. Let's see our original English sentence, the girl gives a rose to the boy. Here, instead of making the boy an indirect object um, right after the verb, which English word order would tell me is an indirect object, I'm going to use the prepositional phrase version to the boy and put that at the end. And I want you to see how Greek case categories match up here. So again, the nominative is the subject and that's the girl. Then we have the verb, and then in Greek, the accusative would be the direct object, that's the rose, and dative is the interested party to the boy. The girl gives a rose to the boy. But there are other examples, so let's look at the boy does this for the father. Similarly, the nominative for the subject, if we were putting this in Greek, would be the boy. The accusative would be this, and for the father, it's a different kind of interest, but for the father would also be in the dative. Or perhaps the baby hits the wall with a ball. So the baby's the subject, it's doing the verb. The wall is the um, direct object, what the baby is hitting, and how he does it with what he does it or she does it. Uh, is going to go in the dative, but this is a different use of the dative case. This is that instrumentality thing. We could even add more interest, more detail to these sentences if we brought the genitive to bear, which can limit the idea of another noun. So the boy does this for the father. Wait, which father are we talking about? Well, let's talk about the father of the king. Which father? The father of the king. So that limits, tells us more specifically which father we're talking about. Or we can do the same thing. The baby hits the wall with a ball. What kind of ball? Let's be specific. Oh, a ball of wool. These are the sorts of things that case can tell you once we start learning some vocabulary to use them with in Greek. And what you're going to learn is that there are infinite sentences that you can make out of Greek and that the Greeks did make from a long list of case uses. So again, you'll look to the spelling of the end of a noun. You'll look to a noun's ending to tell you its case and decide which use of the case makes sense in the context of the sentence. And to know what those endings are, you are going to learn three patterns with variations of endings for nouns, and we're going to call those three patterns first, second, and third declensions. So you're going to learn three declensions. Two of those you're going to learn in the very first unit. And when you learn a new noun, you'll learn what declension it's in and what gender it is. And those two things stay constant no matter what case and number you see them in. They'll always have the gender that goes with them that you learn at the very beginning. A feminine noun is always a feminine noun. A neuter noun is always a neuter noun. 
and a masculine noun is always a masculine noun. And by the same token, they always stay in the declension that they're in. So when you have a noun in the second declension, you'll always decide what case it is based on the pattern of endings for the second declension, not for first and not for third. So you always need to know what declension a noun is in so you know which pattern you're comparing it to when you decide what case it's in. I recommend that you keep a list of the uses of each case, and in fact in my classes I will require you to. You are said to decline a noun when you give it in all its cases and numbers in order, and that's a good thing to practice all the time because you need to memorize the declensions until they are second nature. The analogy I like to give is this. When I learned my first musical instrument and learned how to read music, I learned that this spot on the staff meant an A, and I learned that these fingers on the recorder meant an A, and so I would look at the staff and I would see, oh, I'm supposed to play an A, and then I would think that means this finger on these holes on the recorder, and out came an A. But eventually, through practice and repetition, I would look at the staff and play the note without thinking through all of those steps in between, and that is your goal as you learn Greek. For a while, it will feel clunky, and you will have to go through the pattern and match things up and think, oh, that means the dative, and the dative means this thing. But in, eventually, you'll look at a word, and without registering all those steps in between, you'll know that you need to say, by means of this noun. And that's the goal. Working hard enough and practicing hard enough with these ideas that it becomes second nature and that you're simply reading. And this is the beginning of that process, and now it's time to practice.